at Ephesians, the sixth chapter. I'm glad to be with you. And this week, I hope you've been praying for me. If you didn't pray for me this week, then please pray for me this coming week. And I need the Lord's help. And I hope that all of us together will be praying for each other. We're talking about, in a series of messages, encountering God through Jesus. And we're talking specifically about overcoming the devil. And the scripture teaches that we have been called upon by God to be overcomers. He has called us to live triumphantly, even though we will experience sufferings and we will go through troubles. But God has called us through Jesus to live triumphantly, victoriously in Christ. And so we want to look at how am I going to live and how am I going to have victory over Satan? Well, the only way I can have victory over the devil is through encountering God daily. For God is my strength. God is my rock. And God is the one who gives me the mighty strength to overcome in his wisdom and God's great grace and strength. He gives us the ability, a supernatural ability, to overcome the devil and his work. Satan is at work. He's at work in our families. He's at work in our churches. He's at work in our country. He's at work in the world around us. We see Satan's work even when Jesus was ministering on earth. He was continually attacked. His disciples were attacked. And Jesus himself reminded us that he had come into the world. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus is reminded, John, as he writes, Jesus appeared to put away the works of the devil. He came into our lives. He came into this world to defeat Satan's work. And so I want us now to look at Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and look at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We're here today, and the good news of God's word is that we are standing in the promises of God as we were singing today. And that we have the strength of God in us. God's strength is in you. God's strength to overcome, to live triumphantly. We are not called by God to live and to serve Him by our physical and mental abilities. I want us to make special note of that. It's very important. Because God did not come into our lives and call us to serve Him with our own physical and mental abilities. If that is the case, then we're very limited in what we can do. You and I are very limited if God has called us to serve Him with our own abilities, whether they be physical or mental. If all we can do is use our own talents and our own physical strength, if that is all that we have as our reserves and sources of strength, then there's only little we can do. But God did not call us to serve Him with our own abilities, but God has given us His Spirit to serve Him with His abilities. He's given you the mighty power. The mighty power that you were born with from your mother. God's given you the mighty power that exists through His eternal Spirit. And therefore, I have now been anointed by God. Which means that I have been chosen by God, set apart by God's Spirit for His special purposes. God has given me His wisdom. Because I'm foolish otherwise. God has given me His strength. Otherwise, I'm very weak. God has given me all that I need to serve Him such that I can no longer say, I can't do it, but now I can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There are no limitations to what God has called you to be. There's no limitations to what this church can be. Not because of the pastor, 
Not because of who you are, but because of who God is. And we stand in the mighty power of God. And He is at work in us. That's why I can come into this church and I can say with confidence, the Lord is our help. The Lord is your help. Don't be defeated in your mind. Yes, the situation, visibly, it may look overpowering to you, and you may feel discouraged, but get your eyes and your mind off your situation and put all of your mind and all of your thoughts, put your eyes upon the Lord. And suddenly you'll find the strength and the grace you need to get through every day. And so here we're reminded, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Isn't that wonderful? We stand in His mighty power. This week, I needed to use a razor, and it was low on power. Doesn't have a battery. Don't put 9-volt batteries in anything. Some of you guys, you go and probably know what a 9-volt battery is. Doesn't have room for that. You know what you got to do? You plug it in the wall, and the light starts flashing. And when that light quits flashing white and turns green, you know what? I got full power. You and I, as Christians, we need to plug in to that mighty power. Otherwise, we're dead. God can't use us. We're no good. We may look like a good razor, but if it don't have power, it's worthless. You and I, as Christians, if we're not plugged into God's power, that light's just blanking. It means there's just a little bit there. We need to get fully charged so that when God needs us, we're always ready. And we're ready not because of our own abilities, but because we've been plugged in to God's abilities. Amen. God lives in you. He lives in you if you're a Christian. He lives in this church. That's why I'm excited. Aren't you excited? It ain't about Paul Adams. It ain't about who you are. But it is everything about who God is. And he's doing that work in us. And that's why we have victory today. We go on and read, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He wants a stand. The picture of a soldier. Years ago, I hope I get this story right. And if I don't, I'm, I'm sorry because I greatly respect. I know Hobart. When I first met him, he had a hat on that reminded me he's a veteran. Years ago, I was uh, with my Uncle Rufer, and he was of uh, the 3rd Infantry of the Army, which means he was fighting in World War II, and much of his regiment were killed. Actually, Irvin Brown, when he heard that, began to cry. He said, you know, Paul, when I was enlisted in the Army, I enlisted in the that regiment and it had a different name. But I was reminded when I was standing at attention one time in my service that I was part of this third infantry, most of which had been killed, given their life in battle. And Irvin Brown, I remember he was standing right here at church. He started crying. He said it was a great honor. Roof Roof and Michael. Uh, I told him one day, I was at Miami University, I said, why don't you go with me, Uncle Rufford? I'll take you to this big library up at uh, Miami University in Oxford. They, I, I noticed when I was studying up there, and I was studying my subjects, but I noticed they had a great department on world history and the war. And I said, you might find some books interesting. Rufford loved to read. And I took him up there, and he told me a little bit of a story. He said, you know, we were called the Men of the Marne. And I said, well, I don't know what that means. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot. I should have kept that in my mind. But I, I needed to go research that. And I read a story about these men. And if I remember correctly, the Marne River was where these American troops were told to have one foot in the water and one foot on the land. And they were not to leave, pick up that one foot. Even though the Germans might be approaching, they were told you have to keep one foot in the Marne River. You say, well, what if they didn't? Well, it means if you're one foot, one standing in the river, it means you die. They stood in battle. 
And I probably got a lot of that detail wrong, and I apologize to our veterans who might be listening. I apologize, but that struck me. I read that story, and I thought, how much courage that must have taken. Bravery and loyalty to the cause. How much the cause must have been the cause of freedom. That they paid the price, willing to keep one foot in the Marne River. Not willing, no matter how great the opposition might be from the Germans. They kept one foot in because they knew they couldn't give up that front. That's exactly the picture made here. We're called upon by God to take a stand. In a world that's lost, without direction, often pictured a world of darkness, knowing that the devil is at work, but the scripture says, you need to take a stand. God didn't call us to be cowards. He called us to live triumphantly. We're to be soldiers in the field. Soldiers in the field of sharing the gospel at all cost. And I ask the question to us as a church, what does it mean, the gospel to you and me? Are we willing to take that stand? Are we willing to take the stand? I tell you, many Christians today, we've sat down. We've cowardly backed away from the Marne River. We've cowardly backed away from the opposition, and we have complacently placed ourselves in buildings like this, where it's easy for me to stand and speak to those who believe much of what I believe. But that is not what it means to be serving Jesus. It means to take the gospel to where Satan is. He's the God of this age. He's blinding people unbelievers. He's leading people. He's destroying people's lives. And we are to take the gospel on his territory. That's where God's called us to go and to take a stand. Here's what the scripture says. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth Buckle around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Here we have in this scripture an illustration of a spiritual soldier that God has called us to be in Jesus. If you look back in the last several weeks, we have looked at why did Jesus come and how did Jesus overcome the devil? And through his life and by the examples that he gave us, we see them in this scripture. For example, we know that Jesus said, I have come to preach the gospel. That's what he said. For this purpose, Jesus said, I have come and he would go from town to town to preach the gospel. Does not the word of God say here, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, take the helmet of salvation, does the scripture not say, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace? The scripture 
tells us that we overcome in our spiritual battle by the gospel, by sharing the good news, by being prepared at all times to share Jesus. I heard one time a man was speaking, and he said he was in the airport, and God had laid on his heart that he should share the gospel with a woman there at the airport. And he then approached her and then led into a conversation about Jesus and her aggression, her negativity, surprised him because he thought to himself, God, I did what you asked me to do. And yet she resisted. She was very reluctant and very loud in her response. And so he thought to himself and doubting what God had asked him to do. And yet a man approached him and said, Sir, I was listening to your conversations. I'd like to learn more about Jesus. You see, God knew what he was doing all along. And he knew that the man who was there listening, he was going to respond when he saw this man under attack. When he heard the conversation, God entered into that situation and this man led this other one to the Lord. You see, we are to be prepared at all times to share the gospel with the world. We are not only to share it, but to live it. Every day we ought to get up before we do anything in life and say, Lord, I'm here and I need you to get, me, get ready for the day. Prepare my feet the way they should go. This morning I woke up and I thought of all the things we need to do today. There's all kinds of activities. At the end of the day I plan to go to work. There's some things I need to get done before Monday comes. And usually I don't like to do that, but at the end of this Sunday, I thought I'll go do that. I woke up at 3 this morning, and all these things were on my mind. And you know how it is. When all these things are on your mind, I thought, what good is it to just be here in the darkness thinking about all the things I need to do? So I got up and got my clothes and said, let's get it going. But you know, before I did anything, I said, I'll turn on the television and drink a cup of coffee. I turned it on, and Charles Stanley was preaching out of Georgia. And he was saying, I'm talking to you. And I felt like he was standing there in the wreck with me, you know? Sometimes God has a way of doing that. And he says, before you do anything, before you get up off that bed, off that couch, and before you start your day, why don't you just stop and pray? Because you know what? The devil's schemes will trap you. The only way you can overcome the devil is to put your life and your day in God's hands. And you know what I did? I knelt right down there on the floor and I said, Lord, forgive me. I about took off here this morning to get things done. I can't get anything done unless I put it in your hands first. And so after that, I got up and went to work at three. <laughs> but the point is, is that we need as Christians to realize that we are in spiritual battle. And if we are in spiritual battle, we need to know how to overcome the evil one. And the scripture says, like Jesus, we overcome the evil one by taking the gospel to the world and sharing the gospel of peace, the wonderful good news of Jesus. The world needs to hear. The world has been blinded. There's not many people coming here today. Why? You say, well, it might be you, Paul. That could be true. But you know what? The world's in darkness. The world's blinded. They need to hear the gospel. And we, as Christians, we need to take it to them. We need to take it to where the devil's at. The devil's out destroying lives. I met someone this week. And as I said before, I was speaking to this person. And their life has been partially rocked. This person said this to me when this is all over. When this is all over, here's what this person said. I'm going to come to the church, this church, and I'm going to share my testimony, and I'm going to take Jesus to some people that need to hear it. And I said, that's what you need to do. But she said, I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed. I said, you can't be. God has a new chapter in your life. He's just waiting for you to write it. And with God's help, he's going to write something, and it's going to be beautiful. And you're going to take that gospel message and you're going to share with others what God has done in your life. You hold on. You stand firm.
God's calling us to stand our ground, our spiritual ground. We can't be cowards. We can't be complacent. And we can't be fearful. Because if Satan, if Satan is the work of the world, then those who are sinning are Christians. When we who know to do something, and we don't. Jesus taught us we overcome the devil by taking the gospel and being prepared at all times to share the good news. And how else we need to close. This is very important. All of the scripture is important. I want us to focus on something that we're going to have to close today. We'll come back to this next week. God will be willing. Look what he says in verse 18. Someone tell me, what does it say in verse 18? Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Pray in the Spirit. I want us to look at this and close it. Jesus is about to be crucified. And he's speaking to someone. And he says to Simon, 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 Satan desires to have you. But what did Jesus tell him? But, I love that word in the scripture. So many times, there's a horrible problem. Something's about to happen. The situation's hopeless. But thanks be to God, he's the only one that can do this. He can put a comma there and say, but. You know what I'm saying? You and I, sometimes we get to a situation and say, it's hopeless. I'm crushed by this event. I'm crushed by the illness. I'm crushed, devastated. And it's hopeless. Look again. Look again. Put a comma there. Because God says this. But, and this is what Jesus said to Peter. Satan desires to have you, Peter. But I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And he went on to say, and when you're restored to your walk, I want you to go after your brethren. You see, Jesus never gave up on Peter. He saw how Satan was going to attack him. And you know what Jesus said? I'm going to pray for you, Peter. As Christians, you know how we overcome the evil one? Pray. Pray. Pray for one another. It's easy to be critical of each other. Isn't it? Did you hear what somebody said? Did you hear the profanity? Did you see how they fell? Yeah, they're human. But you know what? God never called me to be a spectator and to take notes of how people are failing. God called me and to pray for others. It's easy to find fault with other people. There's a lot of Christians we're good at. It. There's all kinds of stories. I've heard them through the years. I've been going to church all my life. There's so much gossip. We see humanity and the effects of humanity in our churches. It shouldn't be. Gossip destroys people's lives. We need to spend less time finding fault with others and spreading gossip. And we need to spend a whole lot more time praying for one another because Satan is attacking people. He's attacking this church. And before you take notes of all my faults, and if you're going to take notes of my fault, you better have a big book. Because you're going to be writing a lot. But before you start taking notes about me, please pray for me. I need God's help. I do. Samantha can tell you how many times I tell her, you know, I just feel like I need to quit there. I now think there's somebody better that somebody better preacher could be there. And I allow Satan sometimes to defeat me. I need your prayers. And I need to pray for you. Each of you. Because we all are called by God to be victorious in life. He's called us all to live triumphantly. You don't have to turn there. I'll close with this. I promise I'm going to close. I'm going to read this. We're going to close. Hmm. But here's what God's called us. Listen to these words. Would you pay listen to these wonderful words? I'm going to read this and we're going to close with prayer. I want you to listen. You've read this before. I just want you to close your eyes for a minute. I want you to listen to what God's Word says. Listen with your heart. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, 
how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to stand and I'm going to have the music playing. If you would like to come forward for any reason, the altar's open and then we're going to close in a song. But if you would like to come forward, the altar's open at this time.